Good evening. Good evening, folks. Okay. Um, as you are no doubt aware, Cedar Lane Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church is proud to present Aviva Chomsky, Scholar of Immigration and Immigration Justice, as our annual Kiplinger Ethics Lecturer. Dr. Uh, Dr. Chomsky is Professor of History and Coordinator of Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies at Salem State University. Her academic work focuses on immigration, the Cuban Revolution, and Central American labor movements. Professor Chomsky is well known nationwide as an advocate of immigration reform and workers' rights, and she has published widely in both academic and popular contexts, including 2007 uh, book, uh, They Take Our Jobs and 20 Other Myths About Immigration, and her most recent book, which uh, we have out here in the, in the, in the uh, room behind us, uh, Undocumented, How Immigration Became Illegal. Uh, has received uh, diffuse, uh, a, a few, a few, uh, trouble with that. Uh, ample praise uh, <coughs> from the uh, New York Times as an impassioned and well-reported case for change. She has been active in Latin American solidarity and immigrants' rights movements for several decades, and it is an honor, a, a great honor, to have her here with us tonight at this important time for immigration rights and reform in our country. The title of her lecture, which I think you probably could see as well, A Nation of Immigrants, A Nation of Deportation, Race, Citizenship, and Belonging in the United States. And without further ado, I welcome her to the pulpit and... Thank you so much. Are the... Is this working? Yes. Okay. And this is not working? Okay. Um, oh, now I can hear that it's working. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, and um, it's a great honor to be invited to give the Kiplinger Lecture. Um, and it's also a great honor to be part of a day that is dedicated to Black Lives Matter um, in the UU Church. Uh, because as you will see as I go through my talk tonight, I think that, um, that we need to place race at the center of the debate about immigration. Um, so when I learned that, uh, although this hadn't been planned when I was initially invited, but I learned a couple of days ago that um, my talk was actually going to be part of this larger set of events about race going on within the church, I felt like it was really a perfect fit. Um, a very serendipitous set of events. Um, also, of course, I think that the current debate about immigration is very highly racialized, and that the criminalization of immigrants, the emphasis on creating a climate of fear about immigrants, the mass detention, mass incarceration of immigrants is all part of a larger picture of what's been going on in the country over the last 20 or 30 years um, regarding the criminalization of people of color. Um, not all immigrants are people of color, but, uh, but the criminalization of immigrants is extremely racialized and happening in the context of criminalization of people of color. Um, but it's not only in the last 20 or 30 years that race needs to be placed centrally into our understanding of immigration and, and debates about immigration. And uh, I'm a historian, so you will have to forgive me that I'm going to talk to you about history tonight, but I promise it won't be boring. It's the first thing everybody says when I say that I teach history, but history is so boring. No, it's not. Um, and I only have six slides, so, but they have a lot on them, so, um, so I'm going to spend a lot of time, especially on the first slide, I think, but hopefully it will all make sense by the end, and we should have plenty of time for questions as well. Um, so the title of my talk is A Nation of Immigrants, A Nation of Deportation. Um, we frequently hear um, people opposing 
Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric and anti-immigrant policies um, by bringing up the fact that we are a nation of immigrants, um, perhaps that we are a nation that has always welcomed immigrants, um, perhaps that that's not who we are. Um, and I actually disagree with this approach to uh, opposing Trump's immigration policies. Um, I think that it's quite problematic to say that we are a nation of immigrants, and I'm going to talk about why. Um, we are also a nation of deportation, and I think deportation is just as deeply built into who we are as a nation as immigration is. Um, to say that that is not who we are, I think, presents a really false narrative of the history of this country, and that if we do not acknowledge the true history of this country with respect to race, citizenship, and belonging, we are um, creating obstacles for ourselves in mounting a real challenge to the anti-immigrant rhetoric and anti-immigrant policies that we're being confronted with in the Trump administration. So, I want to start out, hmm, this was working a minute ago. Let's see. Oh, tech person? I tried this when they set it up. There we go, okay. Um, so I, I'm turning this notion of the United States have taken some sort of class in American history at some point. Um, this is still the narrative that you would learn. Um, the assumptions, so probably not all of the details, but the main line of the narrative is that is the master narrative. Um, so I want to go through this master narrative by looking at the four periods of U.S. immigration history. Um, and as I go through the narrative, um, I'm going to be accentuating some aspects of it, but I'm not going to be exaggerating it much. It should sound very familiar to all of you as I go through it. Um, and yet, I'm asking you to listen to it critically. Um, and I'm asking you to listen to it critically from three perspectives. Um, asking yourselves, as I go through it, what's wrong with this narrative? that those three are actually all intertwined. That is, by telling a particular story about labor, we're also telling a particular story about race and geography and any, any way you want to mix those up, anyone you want to put first, uh, causes us to tell a, a different story about, about the other two. So, here I go with the master narrative, and I'm going to be asking you to help me um, point out what's wrong with it as we go along, and I hope come end with a coherent picture of what's wrong with it and why it's important to notice what's wrong with it. Um, so the first period of U.S. immigration history begins in the early 1600s, and it goes until about the mid-19th century. So it's about 200, a little more than 200 years of American history. And the immigrants, immigration historians and others, will tell us 
Um, immigration historians use the term the old immigrants to refer to the immigrants from this period of American history. And they describe these old immigrants in a particular way. These old immigrants are English. And by saying that they are English, we really mean two things. It's a geographical designation and it's a linguistic designation. Of course, it's also a racial designation, but we don't say that. Um, it's a geographic designation in that they come from England. It's a linguistic designation in that they speak English. So these old immigrants had certain characteristics um, in addition to coming from England and speaking English. Um, they shared a religious background, which was Protestant. Um, they tended to come in family groups. Um, they tended to come to a particular part of the United States, of course. Um, they came to the East Coast, and actually, if you look at a map, they came to a very narrow sliver of the East Coast. Um, and of course, they worked. Um, they worked to survive, and they worked primarily um, in a subsistence economy, producing what they consumed. They farmed, they were artisans, they were blacksmiths, they were bakers, they lived in small villages, um, and they, in a rough kind of equality and mutual in interdependence where they sustained each other and, and supported each other, um, they didn't produce a lot for sale, but they, they produced what they needed to consume. Has everyone heard this story? And why did they come here? Okay, everybody said it. I heard it from all over the room. They came seeking religious freedom, right? So you've all heard the story. How many of you have actually taken a class in US immigration history? Only two, three. Okay, so you obviously did not need to take the class in order to know the story. It is the master narrative. It's there. We all know the story. Um, okay. So, having given you some clues, what's wrong with that story? <laughs> some specifics. What's, what's wrong? What's missing? What's left out? What's distorted? Okay, okay, so let me, let me just grab onto a couple of things. Finally, I heard a few voices come out from the crowd. Um, Spanish, French, okay, this has to do with geography. So if we implicitly accept the fact that the history of the United States is the history of the northeastern seaboard of the United States, then telling the story of English colonization is the place where you would begin. If we don't accept that geography, if we point out that the United States is much bigger than the eastern seaboard, obviously we're talking about people from France, people from Spain, we're talking about a, uh, a much more um, broad European colonial experience in what later finally becomes the United States. So, so that's a problem with geography. Somebody said slaves. Okay, so when we tell this story, we're completely leaving out a significant segment of immigrants even in this uh, narrow geographical band. Um, and the reason we leave them out, well, there's a couple of reasons we leave them out, but one of the reasons that we're able to tell this story, leaving them out, is that the very word immigrant embodies within itself the idea of a person who voluntarily crosses national borders in order to start a new life somewhere else. So there's several pieces of that, voluntarily crossing national borders and to start a new life somewhere else. So when we say immigrants, were enslaved Africans actually immigrants? 
Not really, Ben Carson might think they were, but that didn't go over too well. Um, because the word immigrant encompasses the idea of voluntary. It doesn't mean every movement across national borders, it means a voluntary movement across national borders. So, so by saying that this is a nation of immigrants, we are telling ourselves a story that actually leaves out significant numbers of people and distorts what this country is and how this country was founded. Now, when we say we leave out slaves or enslaved Africans, um, we're not, that isn't so much a geographical problem, but it definitely is a labor problem. That is, we're telling a story about labor, about hardworking farmers, self-sustaining. Um, we're not telling a story about plantations producing for export through the violent and harsh exploitation. Um, and we're telling a story about race. That is, we're telling a story that tells us that the real history of the United States is the history of white people. And other people who aren't white aren't really part of the story. They're kind of peripheral to the story. Like, we don't deny that that happened, but that's not the main storyline. The main storyline is that this is a nation of immigrants, hardworking immigrants, and of course they all came from England, and they, they all happened to be white. Who else is left out of this story? Native Americans are completely left out of this story. And this is also a geographical problem. That is, once we've defined the history of the United States as this is a country of immigrants, we're defining the history as belonging to this narrow strip on the East Coast. So we're not telling the story of the Native peoples who occupied 95% of the territory of the United States during this period of the early 1600s through the mid-1800s. Um, we're clearly not telling the story of their labor. Um, we're excluding them from the storyline. So when we say this is a country of immigrants, and have in the back of our minds this story about English people coming, seeking religious freedom, we're basically telling a white history of the country. Well, but there were women also, right? Um, so, okay, that's the... That's the, the first period, the old immigrants. Then comes the period that immigration historians call the period of the new immigration, the new immigrants. And this period of the new immigration starts around 1850, and it lasts until 1924. This is a period of mass immigration. Okay, so now I'm telling you the, the master narrative again. Um, a period of mass immigration. Um, and it's different from the first period, the period of the old immigrants, in several ways. I'm still inside the master narrative, so you should be listening critically. Race, geography, and labor. What's wrong with this narrative? Okay, so these new immigrants came not from England, but from the peripheries of Europe. They came from places like Italy, like Poland, like Lithuania, like the Ottoman Empire, um, Russia, Ukraine, peripheries of Europe. Um, the first, actually, at the very beginning, they came primarily from Ireland and French Canada, other peripheries of Europe. Um, but, but then the even larger movements from, from other, or joined at least, by, by migrants from other of the peripheries of Europe. This meant that, so geographically, they were not from England, and linguistically, they did not speak English. They spoke a multitude of languages, um, and they also primarily were not Protestant. Um, they may have been Catholic, they may have been Jewish, they may have been Orthodox, they may have been Muslim, but they were not Protestant. 
Um, so these immigrants came to Ellis Island, um, the immigration station that was established there to process this mass migration from the peripheries of Europe. Um, they were welcomed by the Statue of Liberty, holding her torch. Uh, they came, of course, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they, they were greeted by the words of Emma Lazarus, give us your tired, your poor. Um, and they came primarily to work in the growing industries of the East Coast of the United States, moving into the Midwest of the United States. So they went to cities like uh, Baltimore, like Pittsburgh, like Boston, like New York. Um, they went to Chicago, and they worked in the new factories. This is also called sometimes the industrial immigration. Um, they became the new working class that filled the factories. Everybody's heard this story? How many people here would say they trace their own family histories to this story? So significant numbers of people identify with this story, and, and you're very representative here, because in terms of population, um, almost half the people here I saw raising your hands as, as identifying this as, as the story of, of, or at least one of the stories of your family's history. Um, but this story is also problematic. Um, who's left out of this story? Chinese are left out. OK. The Chinese did not come to Ellis Island. They did not come to New York. They did not come across the Atlantic to the East Coast. Um, they came, of course, to California. Most of them did not go to work in factories. Where did they work? Railroads. Railroads. <laughs> um, and were they welcomed? OK. So, so if we broaden our geography from the East Coast beyond, um, if we broaden our racial thinking besides Europeans, we call them Europeans, but of course they are white, legally defined as white, um, and therefore welcomed. The Chinese are not white, and therefore they are not welcomed, and they are very specific specifically not welcomed on the basis of being racially ineligible to citizenship. This is the language used by Congress, that the Chinese are racially ineligible to citizenship. Who else is left out of this story? Migrants from the South, primarily Mexico. Okay? This is also a period of mass Mexican migration. Most of the Mexicans also do not work in factories. Where do they work? They work in agriculture. Like the Chinese, they also work in railroads, and they work in mining. There's basically three sectors that employ the largest numbers of Mexicans, primarily in the southwest of the country, agriculture, railroads, and mining. So that is yet another story that is left out or distorted when we tell the master narrative of European immigrants. And I'm going to go much more deeply into this period of the so-called new immigration um, in a few moments. So I'm going to be talking a lot more about the Mexicans and the Chinese and this idea of race, citizenship, and belonging. But I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, to move on to the third period, uh, which begins in 1924. Okay, so now I'm returning to the master narrative again. Um, and lasts for about 40 years, 1924 to 1965. 
is the third period that we look at of U.S. immigration history. And this is the period that's seen as an aberration, as exceptional in U.S. immigration history. It's a period of immigration restriction. This is the period when Congress passes national quotas that put numerical limits on the numbers of immigrants that are allowed to come into the country from especially these European countries um, that have been providing such a large source of immigrants during the, the period of the new immigration. Congress decides to cut it off um, by putting into place these quotas, national origins quotas. How many people, this sounds vaguely familiar? National origins quotas, 1924, okay. So, so in this period, immigration is drastically cut back through these numerical restrictions, the national origins quotas that allow only very small numbers to come in from these countries that have been sending much larger numbers. And this is generally seen as the sort of uh, negative spot out. When we're a country of immigrants, we've always welcomed immigrants. Yes, there was this one period when we didn't welcome immigrants, but that was like not who we really are. And in 1965, we went back to being a country that welcomes immigrants from everywhere in the world. The Hart Seller Act of 1965 created a new period of open immigration where everyone from all over the world was welcome to come into the United States, making a multicultural country um, that welcomes everyone. So that's, that's the end of the story of immigration history as, as immigration historians have constructed it. Um, it's the 1965 law and this idea that like, we got rid of those racial restrictions and now immigration is open to everyone. Is that also slightly familiar? Not really, some people. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and go a lot more into depth into a few particular moments that I think show us a completely different story in terms of race, citizenship, and belonging, and give us a much more coherent immigration, uh, a much more coherent narrative about what kind of a country we really are and the place that immigration has played in our history. So I'm going to go back to the founding of the country, to the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence um, begins with a preamble that talks about the reasons that the colonists felt it necessary to fight for their independence from Great Britain. Um, the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. So the King did a lot of really bad things, right? Um, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So we're going to give you a list of all those terrible things, those tyrannical things, those injuries and usurpations, all the bad things that the king did. I'm sure some of you know some of those things, right? What are some of the ones you know? Taxation without representation. Right? trade restrictions, um, but we don't, sorry? Canceling their legislature, um, restricting political freedoms. Um, but one of those bullet points that we don't usually learn in our elementary school days when we're uh, forced to study the Declaration of Independence um, is the middle one here. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states. For that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. <laughs> 
So the, does everybody follow that? The language is a little old fashioned. So the colonists want more immigration. They want uh, the states to be more populated by immigrants. They want it to be easier for foreigners to naturalize. And they want laws to be passed to encourage migration. Why? Why is this so important to the colonists? Why are they so pro-immigrant? Push the Indians out, okay? So let me just rewrite or talk about the other side of this notion that this is a nation of immigrants. This was a white settler colony. They needed more white people, and immigrants were white people. Only white people were immigrants. Only white people could be considered immigrants because they were trying to displace, dispossess, and replace the native population. And it's right there in explaining the ways that the crown uh, prevented them from carrying out their project of bringing in more white people, they say the last piece of this is and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. That is, raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands, making it more difficult for these white colonizers to take more native land. So the purpose of independence is to uh, free up this settler colonial project that the crown was trying to limit. And this is very interesting as we move on to the second period, especially, but in this period too, um, this is where it really helps to be a Latin Americanist, as I am. Because when you study Latin American history, you learn that during the Spanish colonial period, which lasts from, say, 1492 or early 1500s until 1810, 1820 or so, during the Spanish colonial period, the most privileged people were those born in Spain. They were called peninsulares, peninsulars. Only peninsulars, those born in Spain, could hold the highest political positions in the Spanish colonies. Of course, the native population and the African descended population couldn't hold political power, but even those descendants of Spaniards born in the Spanish colonies couldn't hold the highest positions of power. They were considered suspect, perhaps racially mixed. That is, just by being born in the colonies, the question is, so who is your mother? Who is your grandmother? Anybody from Latin America ever heard that question? Um, so, so there was definitely a privileging of Spanish-born people. They were the most racially pure. Um, and th that was precisely the, the language that was used by the Spanish. They had pure blood. And only those born in Spain could be guaranteed to have pure blood. Anyone born in the Americas might not have pure blood, so they had to be kept out of the positions of power. Yeah. Oh, that's coming, that's coming. <laughs> We're still in 1776. It hasn't come yet, but it's, it's coming in the next slide. <laughs> After independence, almost all of the Latin American countries made state-sponsored immigrate, implemented state-sponsored immigration projects that were very clearly delineated as being projects of racial whitening of trying to improve the racial stock of their countries through encouraging European immigration. Immigration in Latin America was a racial whitening project. 
Immigration in the United States was also a racial whitening project. We just aren't as honest as the Latin Americans when we tell our history. But the encouragement of immigration from Europe, and it is right here in the Declaration of Independence, that one of the goals of independence is going to be to foster more white immigration and to facilitate white taking of native lands, both of which had been restricted by the British. And just as an aside, why were the British restricting white immigration and the taking of native lands? Because from the perspective of the British, think late 1700s, they're building a global empire. These American colonies are only a really small piece of that global empire, and they don't want to invest enough in the Indian Wars to to fulfill the desires of the colonists. They're more interested in their conquest of India right now. It's not really that they honor native land rights, it's just it's not their priority to be focusing their military investment in their American colonies at this particular moment. So they're trying to maintain a balance that allows them to pull out forces from America to use them elsewhere. Okay. Oh, it Manifest Destiny is the next slide, but I still will get to it. Um, so the new country quickly goes about legislating citizenship. Uh, the U.S. Congress in 1790 establishes a uniform rule of naturalization, be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that any alien being a free white person who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for the term of two years may be admitted to become a citizen thereof. New white citizens are welcomed. There is no anti-immigrant prejudice. They want as many immigrants as possible. They don't want it to be hard for immigrants to become citizens. They want immigrants to become citizens as quickly as possible. So for the first 80 years of the country's history, this is the status quo. Immigrants are white people. Immigrants are welcome. Immigrants can become citizens. They don't have to do anything special, no fees, no tests, nothing. All they have to do is be white and live here for two years, and they are automatically citizens of the United States. So this finally changes after the Civil War, and citizenship is expanded. After the Civil War, something radically new is created, which is citizenship by birth. We're so used to citizenship by birth, now we assume that it's kind of the norm. But even today, there are countries that do not offer citizenship by birth. The United States does, although it's been challenged. But it seems pretty embedded now in the United States, the idea of citizenship by birth. But it dates to the Civil War, and it was created primarily to redress the wrong that had been done to people from Africa who had been forcibly brought to the United States and relegated to a position of permanent non-citizenship. So some enslaved Africans became free, some states had abolished slavery by the time of the Civil War, but people of African descent could not be citizens anywhere in the United States. Or that is, they could be a citizen of the state of Massachusetts, but they could not be a citizen of the United States because citizenship was restricted to free white persons. So the 14th Amendment, passed in 1868, begins with a word that I'm sure you've all heard before, all, and I'm sure you all think you know what it means. I don't even have to define it, right? You all know what that word means. Um, but you're wrong. 
Uh, okay, so it starts with this word that sounds like they're talking about all. All persons born or naturalized in the United States. But then there's a comma, and then after that comma, there's a qualification. That is, it's not really all. And subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Okay, that's the qualification. Who is that referring to? Who is born in the United States but not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States? Native Americans. Chinese are subject to the jurisdiction. Native Americans are not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Native Americans are not covered by citizenship by birth. They are excluded from citizenship by birth. So once again, citizenship by birth is a response to African slavery. It is a way of redressing the wrongs done to Africans, to enslaved people and their descendants. That's why all doesn't really mean all. And this becomes even more clear in the Naturalization Act of 1870, which follows the 14th Amendment two years later the Naturalization Act is updated to align with the 14th Amendment. Naturalization laws are hereby extended to aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent. So stop for just a minute. How many people do you think are coming from Africa to the United States in 1870? Any guesses? Zero. Zero. That is, after centuries of forced capture, transport, enslavement, going to the United States in search of a better life is not on the agenda of people in Africa. So the Naturalization Act is expanded to include people from Africa, but it's sort of a, a it exists on paper, but it doesn't actually apply to any real living human beings. However, now we're coming back to the Chinese. Where do the Chinese fall in this? They're not free white persons, and they're not aliens of African nativity and persons of African descent. They cannot naturalize. They are aliens ineligible to citizenship. However, there's a problem. Congress has painted itself into a corner of logical impossibility here by creating citizenship by birth. Because what happens when Chinese people come here and have babies? Those babies are gonna be US citizens, but they're racially ineligible to citizenship. How can you have a citizen who is racially ineligible to citizenship? The law created this logical contradiction. So, this is when immigration restrictions begin. Congress, uh, there are no restrictions on immigration before citizenship by birth, because citizenship is where the restrictions are. Once citizenship by birth is brought into play, those restrictions on citizenship don't work anymore to keep non-white people from being citizens because Anybody can, can reproduce. Um, so the legislation of immigration, the restriction of immigration, is very clearly race-based, and it is put into place after citizenship by birth. This is when immigration starts being seen as a potential problem. The very first group of people who are prohibited from entering the United States, and you can see how Congress's mind works. In 1873, five years after citizenship by birth is enacted and Congress realizes what's happening, that Chinese babies are becoming citizens, they, the first restrictive legislation prohibits the entry of Chinese women. You see how Congress's mind is working? No women, no babies, right? Um, but it doesn't take long for Congress to realize that Chinese men are somehow finding a way to reproduce, even without Chinese women. Um, and so in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed. And after 1882, as 
other peoples from Asia um, are beginning to come to the United States, one by one, they are excluded. And the notion of Asia starts growing and growing um, until 1917, when the Asiatic Barred Zone is declared. All Asians are aliens ineligible to citizenship. Therefore, they're all prohibited from coming. And Asia encompasses about three quarters of the planet's population. This notion of this thing called Asia just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So, there's another piece of this story, though, which is Manifest Destiny. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, and you notice here that I put two laws which are not immigration laws. I put 1862, the Homestead Act, and 1887, the Dawes Act. That is, this period of American history, starting in 1850 and going through 1924, which is the period of mass immigration, which we incorrectly said was going to factory, growing cities, growing factory cities on the East Coast and maybe Chicago, and couple other places in the Midwest. Um, this was also the period when the most massive expansion and displacement of native peoples was going on. And both the Homestead Act and the Dawes Act were laws that granted native territory to white immigrants. Let me say that again laws that granted native territory to white immigrants. So we could call this period manifest destiny. We could call it the period of the Indian Wars. That is, this was an exceptionally bloody period in American history of military genocide and displacement of native populations and state-sponsored immigration of white Europeans directly to the lands that were being taken from Native Americans. Even with the Dawes Act on to Native American reservations that were being broken up and privatized and sold off to new immigrants direct from Europe. Okay, so when we talk about this period of the new immigration as being the period of the mass immigration, we must understand the flip side of that mass immigration. That is white European immigration as a project of population displacement, replacement, is absolutely at the basis of this notion of the United States being a country of immigrants. And we can't just make nice words to make it sound like, oh, it's just poor people coming to, to seek a better life. I mean, it is also poor people coming to seek a better life, but there's a lot more going on than just that if we talk about race in the center of it. Um, so in 1924, it's true that this European immigration was restricted. But this is a tiny piece of restriction because this gigantic thing called Asia had already been completely forbidden from migrating. So when we talk about 1924 as being the beginning of the period of restrictive immigration, we're once again privileging white immigrants as the real protagonists of the story. So it's when white immigration is restricted that immigration historians suddenly start looking and say, oh, restrictive immigration. Um, but let me mention one more important aspect of these restrictive immigration laws of 1924. They did not restrict Mexicans. They did not even mention Mexicans. Asia had already been prohibited. Now Europe was being greatly cut back. Who is going to do all of the work? We need more Mexican migrants. As soon as the United States starts limiting Chinese immigration, the numbers of Mexicans 
start to increase. So my last slide um, I call inviting and deporting Mexicans. Why were Mexicans such a perfect replacement for Chinese labor? Because Mexicans were deportable. I think I say that, yes. Mexicans could cross the border freely, but then they could be deported just as freely. So the United States really had three immigration policies. It had one for white people, open arms, welcome, except that period from 1924 to 1965. It had one for Asians, you can come as long as we can exclude you from citizenship, but once we create citizenship by birth, you're out. And it had another one for Mexicans. You can come, we want you to come, we're going to build railroads into central Mexico to transport you up, we're going to have state-sponsored projects to bring you into the United States to work, but only on a temporary basis. Mexicans are welcome as workers, not as potential citizens. We will not let them stay long enough to have babies and take advantage of citizenship by birth. We want only men, and we want them to come, and then we're going to deport them over and over and over again. So, just quickly, I want to end because I want to have time for questions here, but to just quickly go over the history of how Mexican immigration was legislated during this entire period. Um, in 1848, of course, the United States takes 55% of Mexico's territory through a war of invasion and conquest. Um, and Congress has to decide where are we going to draw the border because they have occupied almost all of Mexico. And there's very clear deliberations that we want as much land as possible, especially mineral-rich land, with as few people as possible. The Mexicans were a mongrel race in the eyes of Congress, um, not eligible for citizenship except for the small, white, pure-blooded Spanish, um, clean-blooded Spanish, as they called it, limpieza de sangre. Um, most of them were not white. Most of them were these so-called mongrels. Um, so to draw the borderline so as to incorporate as much territory with as few people as possible. And then we start bringing them in to work. Sometimes this was informal through recruitment by railroad companies, the building of railroads. Of course, the hand of the state was always there in funding many of these enterprises, in governing these enterprises. Um, between 1917 to 1922 and between 1960. 42 to 1964, actually 1967, um, specifically state-sponsored guest worker programs brought hundreds of thousands of Mexicans in on a temporary basis and deported them as when their contracts um, ended. If you heard the um, Woody Guthrie song, Deportee, anybody heard that? So that, that's what he's talking about here. Contracts are up and you've got to go home. Um, major deportations of Mexicans in the 1930s um, and again in 1954. And these deportations are, have nothing to do with legal status. The whole concept of illegality doesn't really exist during all of this time. They're simply because they are Mexicans. Mexican is understood to be a racial category, and Mexicans are disposable, deportable workers. It's built into the system. Until 1965. So, just to put us in 1965 for a moment. Civil rights activism, protests against the Bracero program, the Cold War, the United States worrying about um, how racial problems in the United States 
are hindering its foreign policy, its ability to present itself to the world as a beacon of democracy and equality and a better life for all. The Bracero program is ended, and the restrictive immigration policies are eliminated. The racially restrictive immigration policies are eliminated. The national origins quotas are eliminated. And the special treatment of Mexicans is also eliminated. Now, in 1965, the Hart Seller Act creates a uniform quota for the entire world. Every single country of the world gets the same quota. No more discrimination, no more racial discrimination. Every single country gets 20,000 a year. Okay, so if you know absolutely no history and nothing about the world, that might look like it's actually treating everyone equally. But if you know anything about the world, you know that in some parts of the world, there are very large countries with very large populations, like China, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, all of those countries that have been defined as Asia, and where no immigration has been allowed at all. So all of these countries get their quotas of 20,000 a year. And there's other parts of the world that are made up of a lot of little teeny tiny countries, all bunched together in a tiny little area. Anybody know what that area is called? Europe. So you have these little countries like Belgium and Luxembourg getting their quotas of 20,000, and then you have these giant countries like China and India and Indonesia, Pakistan, the, not Pakistan yet, but soon, the Philippines. Um, well, Pakistan, yes, Bangladesh, not yet. Um, getting their 20,000 a year. Um, many African countries are still colonized at the time, so they get no quotas because they're not countries, they're colonies. European countries. Um, the Caribbean countries, the British Caribbean especially, are still colonies too. They're not countries, so they don't get quotas. Um, so many of the potential sources of immigration of people of color are actually treated very differently. But where does Mexico fit into this? What happens to Mexico, a country that's been sending hundreds of thousands of people to the United States every year, through a system that has been going on for over a hundred years and established by the U.S. government and U.S. corporations, completely reliant on temporary seasonal Mexican labor, all of a sudden, it's illegal. Because Mexico, the Bracero program is ended, and Mexico has a quota of 20,000 a year. All these same people keep coming, but their status is different, and the rationale for deporting them is different. Now the rationale is not because they're Mexicans, that would be racist. Now the rationale is because they're illegal. So it's not racist. The law treats everybody equally, right? So that's how immigration became illegal. That's how we are both a nation of immigrants and a nation of deportation. And that's why understanding race and citizenship is so central to understanding what it means to say that we are a nation of immigrants and why, at the same time that we say that, we must also understand that we have always been a nation of deportation and that race has been central to our understanding of what immigration means. So, I will end there and open it up for questions. Um, when, I, I realize this is a summary, uh, but in, when you were talking about Asians, I think there, there are two groups, and I spent some time in California working with the farm workers union, so I, I, I came to know 
small farmers who are Japanese of origin, but also within the farm worker union movement itself, Filipinos who, uh, and, and older Filipinos who had come over and couldn't bring women with them. And, but could you say a little bit about mm -hmm. that and how that fit into the, yes, what absolutely. you described? Um, is this still, can you still hear me? Okay. Um, so the Philippines is a very interesting question, and I have a whole chapter on the Philippines in my book, They Take Our Jobs, if you want even more detail. But remember that in 1898, the United States colonized the Philippines. The Philippines was an American colony. And when the United States colonized the Philippines, it had to decide what their nationality was. And the United States decided, so in 1898, uh, just to, um, to, to situate you back in time, um, only white people and people of African descent could be citizens, right? In 1898, the United States makes Hawaii a state. It makes a territory. No, no, not a state. It takes Hawaii. The United States takes Hawaii. Sorry, it's after World War II that makes Hawaii a state. Um, but the United States takes Hawaii in 1898. It takes Guam. It takes the Samoas. It takes Puerto Rico. It takes Cuba. And it takes the Philippines. So what is it going to do with all of these territories? Now, remember that 1898, we are still in the period of westward expansion, manifest destiny, the Indian Wars, territories, and deciding when can a territory become a state. A territory can become a state when it has a majority white population. And that's one of the reasons why territories, territorial governments, are so eager to bring in white settlers um, in order to achieve a white majority so that they can become states of the United States. Of course, indigenous people cannot be citizens. And that goes for the indigenous people of Hawaii as well. Um, the United States decides not to take Cuba because there's too many blacks there. They decide to let Cuba go and keep Cuba as a neo-colony after 1902. They write the Cuban Constitution. They make all kinds of guarantees how the United States is going to control Cuban foreign policy. It can invade Cuba anytime it wants, the Platt Amendment. Um, but Puerto Rico they take as a colony, and the Philippines they take as a colony. Now, Puerto Rico, almost the entire population falls into the free white people and people of African aliens, of uh, people of African descent. In 1917, all Puerto Ricans are unilaterally made citizens of the United States. Between 1898 and 1917, they aren't citizens of any country, but they are US nationals. That means if they travel to the United States, they are not immigrants, they are US nationals. And the same thing is done in the Philippines. As a US colony, Filipinos are not US citizens. As Asians, they are not eligible for US citizenship, but they are US nationals. So like Mexico, the Philippines becomes a very important source of labor, in California particularly, agricultural labor. Um, especially, I mean, the, the, the taking of the Philippines, the colonization of the Philippines happens right on the heels of Chinese exclusion and in the, the, the context of this growing Asian exclusion. So Filipinos are the one group of Asians who are also US nationals. They can't be US citizens, but they're US nationals. So, so that's the, the storyline. Um, those Chinese, and those Japanese um, who have come to the United States before they were legally excluded um, are allowed to stay. Or if they came after they were legally excluded but can prove that they had come before they were legally excluded, prove, 
Um, and the standards of proof are usually based on having a white person vouch for you in court. So if you can find a white person, a citizen, who's willing to say, oh yeah, he was here 20 years ago, then you're allowed to stay. That is, the exclusion is not retroactive. Um, however, as we see during World War II, the Japanese population um, are considered still to be not really citizens, sort of citizens, but their racial Japanese-ness is considered to be this inherent quality that makes them constantly suspect. That is, that there's something about their Japanese-ness that is unchanging, and it doesn't matter how many generations they might have been born in the United States, and thus eligible for citizenship by birth, but there's still something unalterably Japanese about them. So, I'm referring to the Japanese internment, of course, when I'm when I'm uh, talking about that. Towards the end of your book, you... Um, I can't see who's talking. Can you Over here. stand up? Over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's another mic on this side. Towards the end of your book, um, you um, talk about solutions. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you talk about doing away with deportation, with citizenship, um, um, and op having open borders. Of course, it's very controversial right now, but how would you see that actually working with people coming in whenever they want, what, how, going back whenever they want? How, how would you see it working? Well, I mean, I think the answer to that question has to grow right out of everything I just said over the last hour. That is, the regime of restricting, of controlling immigration and of deporting unwanted people, is, its roots are in racism. It has no other justification, no other purpose beyond racism. That is at the essence of the deportation regime from its very first days. And that has been at the essence of this question of citizenship and belonging has been race and racism. So I think that that's important. That is, if you say, well, so we should stop deporting people. Oh no, but they broke the law, it's illegal. That's the justification that comes after 1965. But the roots are in racism. And if we understand that, I think it becomes easier for us to say, oh, so we don't want to deport people because there's no actual justification for it. And this whole question of creating illegality and using it as a reason to deport people is just a way of continuing racist policies using a different language. Um, and my thinking here, I have to say, was really influenced by Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. Have people read that book? Yes. So I heard her speak shortly after the book came out, um, and her basic argument in the book is that as Jim Crow was dismantled, a new supposedly colorblind system of mass incarceration was established based on the criminalization of black people that, that achieved the same ends of exclusion, marginalization, impoverishment of the black community, but without using explicitly racialized language. So, I mean, she goes back, she says, Jim Crow was implemented to replace slavery and mass incarceration, that's her subtitle, right? The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Age of Color Blindness. And somebody in the audience asked a question, what about the criminalization of undocumented people? What about the criminalization of immigrants? And she said, hmm, I don't know, I never thought about that. And I was sitting there in the audience and I thought, I have to write a book about that. <laughs> So that, that was actually the origin of, of my book, was trying to think about how immigration history can be approached from the same kind of paradigm that she used in 
looking at African American history. So, but to, to get back to just more specifically answer your question then, um, I think a regime based on exclusive citizenship and deportation is completely illegitimate and we should just acknowledge that. So yes, we should simply stop deporting people and stop placing any restrictions on immigration. Yes, that's what I think. <laughs> Um, can I ask? I'm over here, over to your other. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is very confusing yeah. when the voice is coming through the microphone. Um, I'd like to bring up maybe another variable, it'd be class. That especially you're going to find that where the emphasis has been on south of the border immigration, a great deal of the quote illegal is really people who come over here as citizens, as students as green cards, as workers, as intellectual workers, and they're still not, you know, and they get preferential treatment in terms of being, you know, applying for citizenship. Um, and also maybe to look at what's behind, not just race, but also economics, to emphasize more and more about how the economic interest of capitalists influences the immigration process. Absolutely. So um, just to clarify, um, only green card holders, only people who enter the country with an immigrant visa, with one of these 20,000 per year, those are the only people who are allowed to apply for citizenship. Come in on a student visa, you cannot apply for citizenship. So how do you get that coveted green card, legal permanent resident, that allows you to apply for citizenship um, there's basically two, two ways to get that green card because there's systems of preference to who those green cards can go to, who those 20,000 slots a year can go to. One is family reunification. That is, close family members of U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents go to the top of the list. And there's a whole complicated a uh, uh, system of what, uh, who's, who's preferred, adult, minor children of U.S. citizens, adult children, siblings, parents, it, it's, it, it's, all, it's all laid out very clearly. Um, so the second system is an employer-based system, an employment-based system, and this is where social class comes into it. Um, because those employment-based visas go primarily to people who have special technical skills who are wanted by a particular employer, who are requested by a particular employer for a job that supposedly only they can do. So the people who have achieved that level of education to, to be eligible for one of those employment-based slots among the 20,000 a year, tend to come from the upper classes. Um, the family-based visas tend to be less, less class-specific. Um, however, if you look at a country like Mexico, where many, many people have family members in the United States, the wait list to get one of those family-based visas can be 100 years. So it's not a realistic option for most people, even in the highest priority categories. There's a, there's a big idea in your book, Undocumented, that I'm still trying to get my head around. And that is your contention that the very notion of nation states and citizenship was born from the desire to create a class of non-citizens available for economic exploitation. I wonder if you can elaborate on that. And a subsidiary question is clearly getting more land and getting rid of the Indians doesn't fall into the category. But other than that, what is the role of cheap labor uh, in this whole immigration history? So, um, I think what I try to argue in the book is that the history of the nation state is a very recent 
history. That is, we lived, we being human beings, lived in a world without nation states for many, many tens of thousands of years before nation states were created um, in the last couple of hundred years. But this, and the idea of the nation state, and here I'm referring to a whole body of literature that's been written about the emergence of the nation state, um, but in particular, a very well-known book, at least among historians, um, by Benedict Anderson called Imagined Communities. If you're not a historian, you probably don't know that book. It's not as famous as Michelle Alexander's. But if you're a historian, any, any graduate level class you take in history, no matter what part of the world, you're gonna have to read that book. Any academic history book you read, it's gonna cite it. It's like one of those books that... So what, what Anderson argues in Imagined Communities is that, and I lost track, where's the person who asked the question? Okay, I want to be able to look you in the face while I'm answering it. <laughs> no, that's okay, now I see you. Um, that the nation, when he calls it imagined communities, that the nation state had to invent a history for itself that convinced people, that used like a family metaphor to convince people that they were related to people who they had never met before. Um, and this also has to do with the emergence of the doctrine of popular sovereignty. That is, when you have a king ruling over people, people just have to obey because they're subjects of the king. But the idea of popular sovereignty, you're supposed to participate and belong, um, and the justification for this nation state is the idea that, just to take France as an example, well, we all have something in common and we all have the same interests because we're all French. Um, now, when France consolidates as a nation state, which we could say is around the time of the French Revolution, 1789, France is nothing like a nation state. It's an amalgamation of different languages, different ethnicities, different religions, different identities. Um, so the project of creating the nation state is the project of eliminating all of those diverse identities and convincing everyone that they're French. And then part of that project also is creating the French Empire and going and spreading this great thing that they've just invented called French civilization around the world and bringing it to all these poor people who, who aren't civilized like France is. Um, so, so, Racism and the idea of uh, a unity of a certain group of people that makes them superior to other peoples um, is really very deeply built into the history of the nation state and exclusivity is as well. So, labor is yet another issue. Um, and justifying the massive exploitation of workers for the benefit of a small elite, um, whether it's through colonialism, whether it's through enslavement, um, is also based on and intertwined with the emergence of ideas about race and racial superiority and the natural status of non-white peoples as inferior and uh, as natural slaves going back to the Greeks, as, as, as people who serve to be an exploited labor force. And I would say that those ideas are still very much with us today in that we all know that every single a morsel of food that goes into our mouths, every single article of clothing that goes onto our bodies um, is produced by exploited labor of people of color, either inside the United States or outside of the United States. And we have a global economic system where this is normalized and naturalized. Um, and it is based on racial ideas that at the same time we may profess colorblindness, we all participate in a system that is racial inequality. 
I have a little narrower question, perhaps. Okay. Um, in terms of the question of deportation from the United States, I, I think most of us are aware of the ongoing and historical deportation, particularly of Mexicans um, who've come, you know, farm workers, the whole, as you say, Woody Guthrie thing. Have there been, before the current era, significant efforts at removing people, large numbers of people who have already gotten here, who are then sent back to where they came from? And if you could speak a little bit to that. Um, so Thank you. I'm going to have to rephrase your question in order to answer it, because your question assumed that the people who are being deported are immigrants. But I would say that the history of deportation is based not on immigration status, that is, again, immigrants were the privileged people during most of the country's history. Deportation was based on race, and the first deportees were Native Americans. That is, to build a country of immigrants, to build a white settler colony, which is what the history of the United States is, you have to deport large numbers of indigenous people. And that is how the country was formed between 1620, 1608, and 1900. It is a history of deportation. And one um, interesting fact about deportation today, and those of you who've been at Streamline Court can corroborate this, most of the people who are being deported to Mexico and Central America today are indigenous people. So it is eerily, historically resonant to sit there in Streamline Court and see these dozens of indigenous people being marched into the room in shackles to be deported. It's just horrifying. Thank you. I'm over to your right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have read that uh, in concert with the Hart Seller Act to exclude Mexicans, that there was an effort that, that took place on the part particularly of legislators from the southwestern states to tighten up the laws around marijuana use. Uh, do you see it in a similar way that this was uh, uh, another way to uh, point out illegal acts and things that they tightened up the drug laws? Um, so the association of marijuana use with Mexicans and anti-marijuana campaigns that are actually anti-Mexican campaigns go all the way back to the 1930s. Um, and I'm not sure about the 1960s in particular. Well, 1970 or thereabouts. I've forgotten now exactly the year when they tightened, definitely tightened law. Yeah, I'm not familiar with, with specific laws passed in the 60s or 70s in the Southwest on marijuana. I just well, don't it's know. a national law. They, well, the war, oh, no, the, the war, war on drugs. drugs well, that's that, that's 80s. 80s. I'm saying yeah. they changed the law during Nixon's administration. Yeah, I, I don't understand. know. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to uh, ask you about uh, the experiment, the deportation experiment of Africans after the Civil War into Liberia. Mm -hmm. uh, was that voluntary or was that, uh, or was that forced? I know it was a spectacular failure, but, uh, uh, and nothing really came of it. And I think well, all of these attempts of for, at deportation are going to end up as failures. but. Uh, was this one uh, any different than the others? Um, I was actually going to come to that after I talked about the uh, Indian removal as, as, as deportation to the person over here who now I lost their face to. Um, uh, but yes, uh, the 
the what were called colonization attempts, the American Colonization Society, um, would really brought together a curious mix of people in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, there were African Americans who supported the idea of colonization, of, of return to Africa, um, even though it wasn't return in a literal sense, because since the slave trade had ended in 1808. The legal slave trade. The legal slave trade. Yeah. Um, but unlike places like Cuba and Brazil, where huge numbers of Africans were still being brought throughout the 19th century, um, so you have many African-born black people at the end, at the turn of the 20th century, you still have many, many African-born black people. In the United States, you don't. Um, so, uh, but there were African-Americans who supported the idea of colonization. There were abolitionists who supported the idea of colonization, who only supported abolition with the uh, idea of colonization. Um, and there were people who, white people who purely for racist reasons supported colonization. That is, the, the country cannot be the United States and not be a white country, despite the 14th Amendment, despite the naturalization law. Um, so I would say that the colonization project was both a racial whitening project and um, an African autonomous project. Um, but as you said, in the end, uh, there were very small numbers of people who, who actually participated, and it was extraordinarily problematic. Does your research um, also talk about se se um, sexual trafficking? Talk about what? Sexual trafficking um, of the, the mostly Asian women. Um, I have not looked into that deeply, no. Do you know who, would, who, who does do research in that area? Um, not off the top of my head. If you wanted to email me, I could probably find me some resources. put together some re references for you. The 1965 Act made employers responsible for not hiring somebody who was in the country without authorization to work in the United States. And one of the categories that was created was for temporary agricultural workers, uh, the H2P, uh, H2A visa, which is unlimited. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that was to and the exploitation of the people who were coming across the border without authorization to work in the United States. Uh, provisions in that made sure that the employers couldn't take advantage of the workers by forcing them to buy food that was supplied by the employer. The employer had to supply housing, had to pay for transportation. But the system basically um, works and it has not worked properly, uh, but it only works if people who continue to come into the country without authorization, without that visa, uh, are hired. And the only way that you can enforce the standards to be applied for the working conditions for those workers is by deporting the people who come in without that authorization. And that seems to me is a major exception to your uh, proposal that nobody be deported. Um, so, uh, the Bracero program was much larger than the H-2 visa program. Um, and the Bracero program um, was ended in 1964, but it was allowed to continue for several more years. So it actually ended in 1967. Um, the H-2 visa program worked primarily on the East Coast. It was primarily workers from the Caribbean who worked in agriculture on the East Coast. So it was almost a parallel to the Bracero program, but a much smaller one. 
But when the Bracero program ends, there still is no border control on the U.S.-Mexico border. I mean, the Border Patrol is created in 1924, but it's a very small number of people, and the purpose of the Border Patrol is not to stop Mexicans from crossing the border, but rather to stop Chinese from entering the country illegally, because it becomes, after 1882, illegal for Chinese to enter the country. So the Border Patrol is created in response to Chinese border crossing from Mexico. And in 1965, when the Bracero program is ended and the quota system is imposed on Mexico, the border is still basically an open border. So there's nothing to stop people continuing to cross the border and working seasonally in agriculture. It's not until 1986 with the Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA, that employer sanctions are created. That is, employers are held responsible for not hiring people who do not have legal work authorization in the United States. That's 1986. Um, however, both the H-2 programs and the Bracero program, and the reason that the Bracero program was ended was precisely because of the exploitation of workers that guest worker programs inherently involve. Because with a guest worker program, whether it's the Bracero program on the West Coast or the H2 program on the East Coast, um, those programs are based on workers being tied to specific employers. That is, your temporary work visa is tied to you working for a specific employer. This makes you extremely vulnerable as a worker. You can't quit. You can't complain. If you're fired, you'll be deported. If you complain, you'll be threatened with deportation. So would it be possible to design a guest worker program that was not exploitative? I don't think so. We don't have any historical examples. And there is something it, to, to treat one group of workers as different under the law and having fewer legal rights as other workers is inherently problematic. Supposedly, under these guest worker systems, employers are supposed to provide housing, they're supposed to provide decent wages. During the Bracero program, they were supposed to be sending money back to Mexico so that workers would receive their money when they got there. Um, those protective provisions mostly existed only on paper. That is, the levels of exploitation. And I have to say, there's been a lot of really interesting work done on agricultural workers. Um, and I'm thinking of two books in particular, very recent books, one by Seth Holmes called Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, and the other by Maggie Gray. Um, the title is escaping me, but it's about uh, dairy workers in uh, the Hudson River Valley in New York. Um, workers, uh, Mex mostly Mexican workers on dairy farms. So Maggie Gray is the author. Um, and both of them look at small farms. And they both, they make really parallel arguments in really different aspects of the agricultural industry that labor conditions on small farms can be even worse than labor conditions on large farms because small farms operate on such a razor thin profit margin that in order to remain competitive, they're forced to overwork and exploit and not provide health and safety uh, conditions for the workers there. So both of these authors are very sympathetic to the small farmers and their plight. That is, it's the system. It's not the individual farmer who is just exploiting workers because they're evil. Um, 
They, the small farmers, too, are just trying to survive. But we have an agricultural system that is based on exploitation. And we have to change that whole system. So, Avi, we have uh, been listening to questions for 40 minutes, and we do have a reception. Uh, would you like to take two more questions, or should we... Why don't uh, I take the two more questions? Um, t tell me the two questions, and I'll try to answer them both really fast. Hi, good evening. I would like to ask you if you have noticed that there is an alignment between the 1917 decision to, with the Jones Law to um, accept Puerto Ricans as, as, citizen, as citizens, because there had already been an attempt in the 1900 with the Foraker Law. But I have seen, I haven't been able to find enough literature, but I, I think that there was an alignment with the recruitment for the uh, war, for world the war First one. World War with that 1917 decision. Absolutely. And I've also noticed that right here in this county, there is a larger recruitment in the high schools where there are large amounts of Hispanics and blacks like Seneca Valley High School, which has a very strong ROTC program. Uh, so I've noticed that alignment. I haven't been able to find any books to read about how the country recruits in the schools and in areas for their army and, and all the, the service when that doesn't happen in Churchill or Walt Whitman or any of the W high schools. Thank you. Have you noticed that? Yes, absolutely. I, there's no question to answer. You're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, yesterday, uh, choirs from this ch choir from this church and several other <clears throat> choirs uh, met at uh, All Souls in Washington to uh, deal with uh, a Sunday devoted to Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. The title of that service was America the Dream, and it featured a black composer whose um, sort of quintessential co contribution was a song, a choir uh, song that uh, was entitled America the, the Dream not too different in some ways from the uh, mythology that you um, criticized at the beginning of your talk. And I'm going to ask a hard question. Is the, uh, is a, must America the dream be abandoned because we have many, made many missteps and done many things wrong in our history, or because the notion of a nation state has become no longer valid? That's not a hard question. That's a really easy question. <laughs> um, so you only have to be in this country for five minutes to start absorbing the master narrative. So immigrants, people of color, people who've been excluded and exploited, Native Americans, it, not only white people have adopted this master narrative. Everybody, probably everybody in the world has adopted the master, has been exposed to this master narrative. Um, it may be racially exclusive in the narrative, but as you said, it's framed in a sort of a universal way that, uh, that many people who are not white can identify with as well. Um, but I want to recommend another book. Uh, this is kind of a tough one, but it's worth it. Um, it's by Aziz Rana, and it's called The Two Faces of American Freedom. Um, and he... Uh, traces throughout U.S. history the extent to which freedom has always been based on exploitation and dispossession. There is no freedom to enjoy 
that is not American freedom to enjoy, that is not based on exploitation and dispossession. So could we create a different country that was not based on exploitation and dispossession? Yes. Have we done that? No. The wealth of this country is still based on exploitation and dispossession. As I was mentioning, every morsel of food that goes into our mouths, every article of clothing that goes onto our bodies. And that's not just for white people, that's for every single person on this country reaps the benefits of exploitation and dispossession through our consumption, because every single person in this country consumes. So I think the dream has a very dark core to it that we have to confront and change if we want it to be a dream that really um, is honest. Thank you very much. There is uh, food and there are books that, for signing that are in the uh, room across the way here. Thank you.